Hello, Future Tribe. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. On this week's episode, we've got Steve Cahan from Thycotic. How are you, Steve? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. No worries at all. Um, let's get the ball rolling. What's, what's Thycotic all about to start off with and what do you do there? So Thycotic is a cybersecurity company focused on protecting what's known as privileged passwords that exists throughout any organization's infrastructure, and I'm the chief marketing officer. Okay, so is it sort of like a last pass, um, but, you know, way way more advanced for sort of enterprise? Is that that how we can think of you? In a way, right? So last pass uh, is a good product, and it sort of works for uh, personal users, sometimes small businesses, and Really where Thycotic focuses in on is non-human passwords as well as human as well. So Mm -hmm. if you think about it, every operating system, database, application, et cetera, has a password associated with them. And big companies have no idea how many passwords they have. And Mm -hmm. so they go unmanaged and as a result, they're not secured. And we help to secure them and reduce their, their risk. Right. So API keys, things like that as well, I assume. Yes. Okay. And how big's Thycotic to get give an idea of, um, you know, um, the, the team behind you? Sure. So actually, when I started at Thycotic, a uh, little over four years ago, we were six million in revenue. Mm-hmm. And now this year, we will, uh, four years later, will be uh, 106 million. So wow. we've been on a rapid growth uh, uh trajectory and it's really the result of the market that we play in and I think working with some amazingly talented people and and just really great solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's um let's sort of rewind a little bit how did you find yourself at Thycotic you give us an idea of sort of your journey to get there and um let's start with um what you sort of did out of school um and you know give us a bit of a timeline. Sure. So uh, now, as you might be able to see, if you if you happen to be able to see the video, that I've got a few lines in my face and some gray hair. And so <laughs> I've actually been in the uh, technology space and mostly in cybersecurity for 30 years. And so uh, when I graduated university, I uh, went to school and you know, would hear very often from my father, when I would grow up, he'd say, Steve, get your degree, go to work for a large corporation. You work hard, they'll take care of you, and you'll have a great career. And of course, he would say, your mother and I would much prefer that you become a doctor or a lawyer. But short of that, getting a job at a large corporation will do. So that was the path I took. And so I graduated university. I went to work at a a large uh, organization processing claims. And I remember uh, staring at my bank statement and the pile of claims I had to process that day, wondering how on earth will I ever get ahead? And I worked long hours, the student loans would take a hold of my paychecks before they'd ever get a chance to hit my bank account. Mm -hmm. So about a year or so into that uh, role, I uh, asked myself an important question, and that was, how could I earn a great living and love the work I do? And that led me into the startup world. And now I am uh, at my seventh startup uh, in a 30 year span. Uh, All six prior have either sold or have gone public, uh, generating over $3.5 billion in shareholder value. Wow, uh, that's some big numbers right there. Um, So how is that codic? So, because, you know, 106 million is quite quite a solid sort of traction for for a startup, how old's Thycotic to start off with? So Thycotic, when, when I joined, I joined along with our CEO. He and I had worked uh, together in the past when a venture capital company invested in the company. And, um, and Thycotic was a few years old when we joined. Mm-hmm. And now uh, we uh, uh, are about eight years uh, in the making. And so the, the first few years, it sort of struggled around. around. It was bootstrapped company. It had a, a good product, uh, but really the founder uh, needed some help and capital to grow the company. And it's when the 
Insight Venture Partners actually bought into the company and brought in uh, people like myself and the CEO. And we really took a great start and a great foundation that the company had also a tremendous culture and uh, built on it and, and did sort of the things that, that experience uh, uh, technology executives would do to mm -hmm. help uh, the company get on that growth path that we have been fortunate enough to achieve. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And um, we're jumping around a little bit, but now you said this is your this was your seventh startup you worked at. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So let's rewind. Um, actually, how old are you now, if you don't mind me asking, just to sort of put things on an actual year year sort of timeline? For sure. So I'm actually 58 years old. So uh, I'm a old and over the hill. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you don't know how science is going for, for all we know, we've got a, you know, another hundred years left in you. <laughs> um, so let's go back 30 years. So that'll put you at say 28. Um, is that when you started your first startup job? Yeah, actually a, a few years before that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, uh, started uh, at the first startup. I kind of made all the mistakes in the world just in terms of joining that company. But uh, but uh, the, the company that I joined, um, it was pretty cool. It was uh, I was the first person hired into marketing, and um, it was uh, hired into a company with a small team of crazies hell bent <laughs> on changing the world and changing the way applications were being developed. And so right. it, it was pretty cool. I mean, it, when I joined, uh, interestingly, in the first week, I remember looking at the office next to mine and there were people rolling uh, out the copy machine. They unplugged it, put it on a dolly, rolled it right out. And I came to find out a few days later, it was because the company couldn't afford to pay for that copy machine. Wow. And uh, it was, it was uh, you know, pretty interesting, but I was blind to it. I was so pumped and excited to work on this venture with this team that just was so passionate, had this just uh, total commitment and belief that somehow we would figure it out. Mm -hmm. And just a few years later, that company that couldn't afford to pay for the copy machine it went public and I got the bug and never left the startup world. Wow, what year was um, what year was it when he joined? Oh my goodness, many many years ago. I mean, it was <laughs> probably twenty five years ago. Okay, yep, yep, yep. So you were the first person going into marketing or into the sort of the marketing roles at that yep. the, that organization. How did you manage to actually nail that one down? Like, um, did you have marketing experience before? Did you study marketing? Um, how did how did you manage that? I really didn't, right? And so um, I was just super aggressive just in terms of uh, being uh, persistent with the company's executives. Uh, they probably couldn't afford a, an experienced marketer either. So mm -hmm. circumstances were such that it worked on both ends. And they knew that I'd uh, stop at no ends to, uh, to, to do what it would take to really learn the ropes that it, it was cool because you know, if you think about it, if you're hired into a large corporation, you're oftentimes hired into a smaller pigeonholed role where your sphere of influence is, is quite small. And so uh, being hired into that startup, if the work was going to get done, I was going to be the one to do it from a mm -hmm. marketing perspective. And so what that gave me the opportunity to do was to try everything, right? And it was just so cool to get that opportunity to try things that I had never before. And I took the opportunity, if I would read articles or read about some cool marketing that organizations were doing, I would contact the people that were referenced in those articles at that time. And oftentimes those people, um, they realized that there were others that helped them to achieve the success that they uh, had achieved. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to talk about themselves and um, share some of the lessons that they learned to help me to uh, navigate around some of the trial and error approach to helping a small company um, learn how to market effectively. And so it was really cool. I was working, you know, sort of uh, very closely with some amazingly talented um, executives. Again, if I was working at a large corporation, for example, even right now at Facebook, I mean, you couldn't even get around Mark Zuckerberg's no. security to ever rub <laughs> elbows with him, right? And so I, I wasn't working with 
people of the you know, Mark Zuckerberg's type, but also very talented people, very mm -hmm. smart. And so um, I took the opportunity to learn everything I could to go to, um, to just take control of my own training to, um, to, to really focus on doing and learning and failing forward sometimes. And, uh, and as I mentioned, um, we were more successful than, than, uh, uh, than I had ever dreamed when I joined. And, and it was why the company just a few years after I joined was able to grow to the point that we were able to go public. Go public. Yeah. I mean, this, this story, your story uh, really hits home because um, it's sort of similar to how I sort of did things, you know, going my first real job um, was at an offer profit who couldn't afford, to be honest, you know, couldn't afford a hotshot marketing guy. Um, in fact, they could only afford me two days a week um, or three days a week, I think it was. Um, and the beauty of it and, and why I can, you know, see why you fell, fell for startups is that you go into this uh, organization who's just essentially created this role. And, you know, yes, there's, there's individuals in there who can, who have the foresight to see that marketing is important and that marketing sort of something that they've got to focus on, but there's, there's not the rigidity around it that you're for, forced to sort of go in and you're boxed in and there's people saying, no, this is what you, I want you to do. Um, especially when you're starting off, it gives you that freedom to experiment, freedom to, you know, look into things and say, okay, let me try all this. And, um, and yes, okay, the budgets might not be there and you might not be making, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollar ad purchases and things like that. But what you get instead is, this very, I mean, this bootstrapped, you know, every, every, everything that you do, you have to test yourself. You have to understand the parameters within which to work. You have to report. And it's almost like you just get a whole bunch of training. It's like that real life, life training that you can't necessarily get from school and, and college. Yeah, no doubt. And, and I learned an, a very important lesson uh, early on in my career from getting that opportunity. And essentially it was this, is that at least uh, from a marketing perspective is you could talk to all sorts of marketers and you know the world of marketing certainly has changed. It's changed for the last couple of years, but I can assure you it has changed dramatically from, from that uh, time. But the important lesson that I learned was that uh, that marketing needs to contribute to revenue. And it might sound like, well, of course it does. I mean, that's <laughs> a simple statement, but you'd be surprised how often you will talk to those who happen to have uh, marketing uh, expertise and like the last thing that they'll focus in on or um, that they'll talk about is the stuff that they're doing and how they're actually contributing to the revenue growth story of the company. And it was that very simple concept that I have always kept uh, in the back of my mind, no matter what the challenge, no matter what the industry or the, the stage of the company. And uh, it is that perspective and lesson learned has served me well uh, in 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it can be revenue, it can be value, but market marketing has to generate something. I think, um, especially nowadays, I, I don't know, I don't know what you, what your thoughts are out there, but marketing is one of those, you know, everyone seems to have their own marketing agency or their own digital agency. Uh, they build websites and chatbots, and it seems to be this thing that anyone and everyone sort of does um, because, you know, relatively low barrier to entry um, saying that, you know, I'm, we both know that, you know, the difference between someone who really knows what they're doing in marketing and has no idea is, it's just huge. Like there's, there's just no comparison between the two, but, but the lay person doesn't see that, um, which makes marketing, I think one of those spaces where people see it as a black hole. Sometimes, you know, people just see, oh, you can spend a whole bunch of money on marketing, but all you're doing is giving, Facebook money or giving Google money. What are your thoughts on, on that sort of perspective on marketing? Yeah. I mean, I see that all the time and I, um, uh, of course work with psychotic, but I meet with uh, companies and entrepreneurs that sort of ask for advice. And, and essentially when you look at sort of a strategy that I found that works, it's, it's essentially this, 
first of all, if you want to be successful from a marketing perspective, is that you, you have got to know your customers as well as you know yourself. And so uh, it really starts with that. It's understanding the customer uh, implicitly. And oftentimes, what you'll find uh, is not what you think. So uh, take Thycotic, for example, we're in cybersecurity. However, the users of our technology actually oftentimes aren't security people, they're uh, IT admins, right? And these are people who are very busy, have diverse roles, security is one of them. And so they want technology that's super easy to use, it's customizable, it works the way they want to work, it doesn't get in the way, right? It's fast uh, and simple. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you would say, well, gee, you're in cybersecurity, you're, you're supposed to be all about, you know, value proposition that includes security. And of course, we have that. But, um, but we focus in on our customer, and we realize who's, who's influencing. So it's really, uh, first and foremost, understanding the customer. And then I think once you do that, I have learned that I spend a great deal of my time, uh, even right now on uh, making sure that we are creating a uh, amazing uh, value proposition that is uh, differentiated vis-a-vis -vis our competition on the basis of that understanding. We focus, uh, uh, I focus uh, personally a good deal of my time on our company's content. Uh, and when I say content, I'm saying things like free tools or trials or educational materials or surveys that they could take to find out how they stand relative to their peer group, things where they'll get immediate feedback. And so, um, and it's that content that has to be so great that it causes those target buyers to actually respond, mm -hmm. right? And so, and the response is a lead, right? And so most people, uh, if you're like me, you almost never give away your contact information online. And so uh, our when you come to our website, what, what you would see is a 6% visitor to, uh, to a lead conversion rate, which is world class. Wow. And so yeah. I focus on the content because I know it's got to be so good that the people that come to our site uh, actually give up that information and enable us to get that uh, visitor to website conversion rate. And and if you're able to then drive that conversion rate, those are leads, then you're tracking that ultimately to pipeline and then, and then revenue, right? And it's some of those very basic points that, um, that may sound you know, quite foundational or simple, but you'd be surprised how few companies actually get that uh, overall mix right. Yeah, I mean, and it sounds like what you're talking about is you guys do a lot of content marketing and content marketing has been big for a long time. I've been going on about it. And, you know, when when we start talking to clients um, who are just starting off and, you know, let's say they don't have a huge budget, what I generally tell them to do is start writing blog posts that are very insightful, very, very niche, uh, very specific to what they do. Um, and it sounds like you guys have sort of grown past that, which is no surprise um, because you would have, you know, run out of the run out of content to write about or run out of um, people who just want to read about that stuff. And you've kicked content marketing up another level. And that is to create surveys, create tools, basically put in more investment um, into what is content. Um, but, content that is providing um, more value to the, to the end user as well. And therefore, like, like you've been able to do, um, get them into sending you their contact details because you've shown them that you've got the expertise and you've es essentially helped them for free because, um, I mean, all these tools, I'm, I'm going to guess these tools take, once you've set it up, yes, there's maintenance, but there's no, there's no manpower needed you know, per tool. That just scales up. Uh, completely yeah. sort of hands free and is that is that right in terms of what I, what I'm thinking how, how that the the reason that you've been able to sort of really leverage those tools absolutely right and you said a key word and that is value right and so a lot of times people create content that is more self-serving in a way rather than serving the customer and the content's got to be hugely valuable you know, I'll give you a couple of examples so, um, you know, one example is we do what's known as a privileged password uh, risk assessment, right? And so 
in this case, it's, um, it's like very, the methodology is sound and basically someone could come in, take, uh, answer some questions, and then they will get a grade like university, A through F, how they're doing. It's, uh, it's uh, really solid for them to, to understand where they stand mm -hmm. relative to their maturity within what's known as uh, uh, privileged access management. And so they will not only get a grade, they will find out where they're doing well, where they're not doing well. And then um, uh, they will also find out where they stand for each of the uh, questions that they responded to relative to their peer group, which is companies in the same industry and uh, of a similar size uh, around the globe. And so people love that stuff. Like they want the immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. They want to grade. They want to understand where they stand. And then what's cool is because it's integrated then with our sales force, the sales people could then be very consultative and say, gee, tell me a little bit about the results that you, that you uh, achieved and let's talk about how we might be able to help you. Mm -hmm. You know, that is, you know, real value or we uh, have a free tool that discovers these, these uh, uh, passwords that you might not know that exists and we do it for free. Yeah. Right. And so, um, you know, people have no idea just given the complexity and the size of of, of their infrastructures, what they have. And so this is functionality that is actually in our paid for product that we decided to give away for free, right? And so, um, so it's offering real value. And when you do that, you create a great first impression uh, of, of the company. Uh, it's a win-win. And then you have positioned yourself to earn the right to do business with, uh, with the people that uh, requested that that content. Yeah, uh, that's something that I've found um, naturally as um, these you know channels get inundated, the quality has to increase. And again, that's what you're talking about as well. It's it's increasing quality, and that 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 takes just more investment. So it's no longer you know. Um, getting someone to spend two, three hours writing a blog post. It's spending hours and hours and testing it all out. But what you're able to do is get, get some of that proprietary information that you've been able to co collect and understand by working with all your clients and then uh, boxing that up in a way that um, gives value, provides value, not the complete value, but enough to sort of show them what, what life can be with, with what you guys are doing and, you know, um, becoming a customer um, so that you're sort of raising that bar where in the past I mean um, there was a time where you know all you needed to do to you know ask someone to give you um, give you their email address was just put a box and say enter your email address and nowadays I think people are much more hesitant to do that sort of thing I mean um, I, I, I sure am so you're you're sort of it's it's becoming more competitive right um and you just gotta you just gotta beat beat out your competition because um i'm actually not sure who who, who are your competitors uh, you know thycotics competitors are, are there some really big players in in the yeah the there's a, a, a larger competitor public company by the name of CyberArk, mm -hmm. right and so you know it's key that uh they're a good company uh good people that uh good products right and so uh, you know, we think we we have some uh, uh, competitive differentiation that actually uh, a lot of customers desire, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, you know, for us, uh, what we try to do is we try to focus on how we can uh, offer value in ways that they cannot. And uh, and obviously, uh, the the growth that we have achieved is uh, is pretty fantastic. It's it's uh, three times the growth of the industry, right? And so uh, clearly we're, we're doing something right and, and probably uh, uh, doing a good job of being a worthy c competitor to, to CyberArk. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, um, you, you've, that's a very politically correct way of saying you guys have a better product. <laughs> Well, I think so. I, you know, I think we do, but um, you know, it's it, that ultimately is judged by uh, share of wallet, right? Yeah, the, definitely. You know, we're, we're customers, uh, potential customers. They um, they buy technology and they want it to work and meet their needs, right? And so uh, they want to be good stewards of their company's money. And 
you know, we have focused on some, um, some areas just in terms of differentiation, of, of, for example, uh, ease of use, um, simplicity of the product, uh, just being, uh, being one area that, uh, that we think we shine. And we think that a lot of people, they, they, you know, they want to move away from complexity uh, now more than ever. And, and that has been a big focus, uh, uh, namely usability mm-hmm. uh, of our technology. Yeah, just making things simple. Um, I mean, again, um, when I'm looking for a particular type of software, what I do is I sign up for trials, um, play around with it. And if I can't work it out um, within the first five or 10 minutes, I just, that, that gets crossed off straight away because it doesn't matter how powerful it is. But, you know, if, if the onboarding pro- process, especially nowadays with so much knowledge around that area, I mean, there's, there's just, I'm sure there's millions of articles around just optimizing the onboarding process and making it easier for people. Um, and, and my thought process is that if that, that first five minutes is difficult, Oh boy, you know, I would hate to think how the, the next five minutes and so on and so forth. And let alone, you know, if it's a program that I have to train someone else to use or that I need other people to use, um, that's just not a road that I want to travel down. So usability is a huge thing these days. Um, because again, the the usability just in general, I, I would say that usability has has improved across the board. Yeah, I mean, and certainly um it worked for Apple. So if it's good enough for Apple, I think it'll be good enough for Thycotic. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Hey, um, I know you've released a book recently as well. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, I wrote a book uh, called Be a Startup Superstar. And so um, it's really geared towards um, young professionals or those who feel stuck in their corporate career. Mm-hmm. And so it focuses in on um, why someone should choose a startup over a large corporation, how to find and land a job at a good startup and how to select a good startup. Uh, and then what I call under seven keys of the, to the C-suite, 35 actions, attitudes, and behaviors one would have uh, to achieve success at a startup. Uh, it's very much uh, a quick read. It's written in a uh, how to uh, format and uh, it actually has become an Amazon bestseller. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Um, it, do you have an audio book accompanying that as well or is it just? A- yes, yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it was published uh, by Wiley as well as Audible. Okay, awesome. Um, I've got an Audible subscription. I'm a big audiobook fan. It sort of it's just a good way to digest content while um, still getting things done. I find so um, we'll we'll link to that um, in the description as well for for you to check out. But could you give us um, could you distill some some of the some of the messages you pass on in that um, in the book? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, one of the key messages is some of the things that I look for when I select a startup. Right, so there's lots of startups uh, uh, that uh, the CEOs of which have uh, great stories, but, but for example, how do you differentiate a startup uh, that has a good story versus a startup that has both a good story as well as a good chance to succeed? Mm-hmm. So I talk a little bit about some of the criteria that I look for when I join a startup. Uh, so for example, Uh, One of the things that I uh, look for is quality people who share the same values that I have. And so uh, people reflect a company's culture. And so, you know, if you're meeting with the, you're interviewing with a company, if you, if you are meeting uh, with the management team and, you know, if you've got to look for a team that really rocks your world. um, And if you uh, sort of, uh, see that there could be some disconnect in terms of values, I I oftentimes say move on. And one of the questions that you could ask to determine those values, if you're in the interview process, that I often ask is, if you weren't building your startup, tell me what you would be doing, Mm -hmm. right? And so that really gets at a question that um, highlights some of the values that that person has. For example, are they uh, potentially going into the direction where they're a you know micromanaging workaholic. Do they have other hobbies or things that perhaps you may share in common, mm-hmm. uh, in which you might uh, start to build a little bit of a deeper relationship? Does the person, for example, talk a little bit about their family? 
uh, as well, right? And so um, you really could uncover some gems. Uh, another question that I'll ask uh, to understand the values uh, is, tell me what you love about your team and why are you the ones to solve that problem? And so there, again, you're, it's a very insightful question where you'll oftentimes be able to find out if, if this is an organization that is team oriented, are, are they I people where they're taking all the credit or are they we people where they're sharing the credit, right? So I go into uh, a number of uh, items that I look for uh, as well as the very specific questions that I would ask underneath those items, uh, such as the ones that I've that I've outlined, and uh, these are uh, sort of uh, some of the lessons that I've learned in being fortunate enough to having uh, selected uh, now seven amazing startups that that achieved uh, great growth. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like those those tips can be used for almost any sort of job interview or. Um, I guess even even just other interviews, I, I could imagine asking some of those similar questions on a first date even. <laughs> so maybe maybe we've uncovered sort of a whole new market. Maybe you can um, change around the title and uh, look at selling into, you know, maybe, maybe the dating and relationships uh, space as well. Yeah, well, actually, my wife who's listening to me right now probably will ask me to shy away from that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, that's not a bad idea once the book sales start to trail off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You can, you can diversify, swap out the cover. Um, I guess it's just my way of saying that, um, you know, it's especially nowadays, you know, I think it's, it's a big thing. To, everyone's sort of saying you should start your own business, start us, get into a startup. Um, but you know, there are a lot of people out there who, who, um, wouldn't do well starting their own business. Um, but then the next best thing is to join a, join an organization that is doing, that is in line with what they want to do that shares their values. Um, and arguably, you know, there's more power now for someone to do that than, than ever before in history. Um, you know, whether I, I totally it's agree with that and I, you know, I could give even um, your listeners a couple tips of how to find them. Right. Mm -hmm. So for, for example, in most Every major city throughout the world, there's uh, what's known as accelerators. And these uh, accelerators, particularly in technology, but what they do is they provide capital, uh, expertise uh, to the uh, companies that they, uh, that they perhaps might fund. Mm -hmm. And what you'll often find if you Google uh, startup accelerators uh, within uh, your given city or a city that you might want to live, a lot of the portfolio companies or the ones that are uh, involved with that accelerator, uh, they are listed and a lot of times they will be posting their jobs online right there. And think of it like startups, these are not the companies that like are, they're, go they're not going to career fairs. They're not uh, doing some of the things that the large companies uh, have the benefit and the resources to do to go find talent, but they'll put their jobs uh, in uh, on these websites, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're 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 unknown, and so I, I encourage people to take a, a look at those accelerators and to Google them. And another is that if you start uh, uh, following some uh, some companies, and in particular some of the executives at those companies that you might consider that you might want to join, and take a look what they say online and. Uh, with uh, technologies like LinkedIn, um, is so long as you try to do an outreach in a non-salesy way, in a sincere and a heartfelt uh, manner to the executives at those companies, if you're following what they're saying, and uh, oftentimes uh, talk about uh, how you would like to uh, be able to learn from them to get some advice for your career, um, what you'll find is that uh, as I'd mentioned uh, earlier, that a lot of executives, they realize there are people that help them throughout uh, their career. And uh, now don't be dissuaded if not, you don't get a response from everyone because they're busy people. Yeah. But what you'll find is you'll get more response than you actually imagined. And, uh, and so long as you take the approach that I mentioned, and then typically you're able to bridge the conversation to you 
and then start to talk about uh, yourself and what your uh, aspirations are in terms of your career, which then opens you up directly to uh, jobs that may exist within that organization or within that executive's network. And so people do not go to the executives often enough directly. They oftentimes sort of apply in the same old way as everyone else, which is the standard HR route, which isn't to say that that's uh, a bad way that you shouldn't do that. But I've had a number of people, for example, uh, outreach to me over the years mm -hmm. and, uh, and they uh, have, created uh, strong relationships with myself, some of which uh, I've hired or have referred on to others, and many others just like me do the exact same thing. Yeah, it, it's just, you know, that advice of um, talking to people like, like they're people, not like they're, you know, big job opportunities or, you know, um, opportunities to earn money or, or so on and so forth. Um, it's something that bugs me on, on LinkedIn, for example, I, I get these opening like four or five paragraphs about, you know, um, and it's a classic format of, you know, this is what we do. Uh, this is how cheap we are. These are, this is some examples of some work that we've done. Hey, why don't you work with us? Um, they don't know whether I, I'm looking for someone like them. 100% of the time I'm, I'm not. And second, if someone did that to me in person, I, I wouldn't even, I, I wouldn't even know what to say. I mean, how, how would you like that if I came up to sit you and said, you know, Hey Steve, you know, this is a description of who I am. Um, I am very cheap. I earn only 25 bucks an hour. Um, you know, want to see some of my work? Here's my iPad. Just go through some of my work. How about we work together? Like that just wouldn't happen. And, and, you know, you're talking really just about build, just, just treating them like people and having that conversation. And I think even, um, putting it out there, um, and just, it's not about sort of, you, you're not owed anything, but if you approach it like, like a sincere individual who would love a help, helping hand, most people will look at that in that way. Um, that they, that yes, they're time poor and yes, they're, they're busy, but um, they're much more likely to, you know, look at it in a favorable way if you would approach it correctly versus just spamming people and asking for things. Absolutely. Uh, and as you mentioned, you, know, you sort of are talking about people um, selling you. I mean, probably a lot like you, I get tons of uh, emails or even calls to my cell phone on a regular basis in exactly the same approach and manner and style that you outlined. And I respond to none of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, you know, but, but I mean, uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, whether, uh, you know, in the case that I mentioned, it's, it's really about people helping people. And, and again, not everybody will be willing to do that. But what you'll find is, uh, more often than not, is that, um, that, that good people will, uh, if they're approached in the right way, uh, uh, try and help others. I, I, I certainly do. And I believe many others do. And so uh, I encourage people to, to try that, right? In, in particular, if you're you know, thinking about uh, uh, changing jobs or thinking about taking your career forward. Yeah, and, and, and it won't hurt. I, I, I just can't think of any, any, a situation where if you do it correctly, that there's any sort of damage. The worst thing that can happen is that they won't respond to you or they will just respond saying, sorry, you know, very time poor, appreciate it, but, but can't chat right now. Um, hey, have you, um, you, you've talked so fondly about startups. Have you ever thought about getting into starting your own business yourself? Yeah, I actually did. I uh, did start a, uh, a technology company that um, that grew rapidly. It was ultimately uh, sold to Novell, and uh, oh, it, wow. it, was of, it was a lot of fun. Um, I I like uh, typically uh, getting in with a company that's a little bit bigger, right? And so there's you know a couple of stages of startups. You know, one is starting it from the absolute ground floor. Uh, you know, in that case, uh, you know, writing a business plan over a weekend and, and seeing it through, finding the funding and, and all of that, uh, uh, I, I tend to prefer, I think that there's a lot of amazingly great small startups, much like Dicotic was. And so I, I, I really enjoy those types of companies because they've gotten through the initial sort of prove it uh, phase. Mm -hmm. And then it really uh, is all about can the company scale and grow and it's really that stage of startup that I, I in particular uh, in, 
enjoy. And a lot of people are concerned about um, starting a startup from scratch. I mean, you know, sort of you know, mentioning the name Mark Zuckerberg, there's you know, not a lot of them. <laughs> so like if you could find the, the phase two, you know, maybe you're like me and you're not Mark Zuckerberg, right? But yet you can still uh, have an amazingly great career uh, uh, professionally and, and personally and financially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it is, um, it's sort of funny because I got in, I started my own business so that I can do more of what you were talking about and go in, obviously we go in more as a, as a partner, as a, as a service provider, but you know, jump, being able to jump in and, um, almost just like propel things forward, feel that fire. So you're not, you're not trying to help someone just even work out if there's a market for what they're, what they're trying to do what they've, they've already got past that stage. Um, and it's just a matter of then really, um, looking for exponential growth or, or looking at sort of triggers of exponential growth versus just trying to get traction. And, um, that's, that's definitely really fun. Um, Hey, in your last 30 years, uh, you know, in, in your career, um, what are, what are some mistakes that you've made, whether it's sort of specifically marketing related or if it's just career related, um, would love to sort of look into some sort of uh, teachable or learnable moments. Sure. So I think one of the biggest concerns people have of startups in particular that I hear is that you're going to have to work 24 by seven. Right, and so that it is just all work all the time, you're never off, right? And so um, a lot of people just simply uh, don't want to uh, be out of a balance from a, a work-life perspective. And so I uh, am without question a workaholic, but what I learned early on, and it was such an important lesson, was uh, how to actually uh, achieve more of a balance. And actually, I really don't like the phrase work-life balance because it suggests that there's a right answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, there was a phrase I heard called work-life harmony. And I really like that because I think things ebb and flows. But what I learned specifically was this, is that if any of your listeners are like me, they uh, live a lot of their uh, life through their calendar right? So you're scheduling meetings, you're scheduling your appointments, and that really guides a lot of what you might do during the day. And so um, what I would say that you can do to kind of have better work-life harmony essentially is this, is you've got to learn how to protect your calendar. And so um, if, if you're listening right now, what I would challenge you to do is to open up your calendar and take a look at it right now and see how many meetings that you have scheduled with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet if you're like most people, the way I was as well, uh, many years ago, that you probably have too few. And think about what that means. What that means is, is that people will uh, schedule time into another, you know, soul sucking meeting, or you're, you're missing time with, uh, with your family or a kid's game or not having a meal, uh, dinner, or maybe even uh, breakfast occasionally at home with your, with your family. You're not uh, perhaps uh, working out at lunch if that's something that you like to do. Maybe you're not blocking out time to think strategically or maybe even to uh, learn something new and focusing on uh, your own education. And so what I learned was, was how to make myself the most important priority on my calendar and go schedule those meetings and I'll do so in advance. And that really helped me to uh, uh, just gain a, a better sort of uh, harmony from you know, both the work side of things as well as uh, my family. And uh, it is a lesson that has served me uh, very well over the course of the years. Yeah, I've never heard anyone sort of put it the way that you've put it, but you know, makes a lot of sense. You you book in meetings with other people or or clients, but what why what's stopping you from booking in you know meetings with your family, meetings with yourself, um, whether it, whether it is like you said, working out or even just going for a walk um, at lunchtime. Um, it doesn't have to always revolve around just work. And I think um, when you're sort of in that hustle mentality, you 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 probably falsely think that just every hour in front of a computer or every hour doing 
work um, is is how you maximize your time and maximize your productivity. But um, I've found again, you know, there there are nights or there are there are even days where I've more or less checked out. You know, I'm I know I'm not as productive, but it's just it's what I need because, you know, maybe I worked for six, seven days straight. Um, maybe I just, I'm a, I'm a bit more tired than I usually am. And I just need to sort of check in with myself and sort of go, okay, you know, today is a day that I spend, um, doing more of the working on the business, more of the, the fun stuff, you know, let's work a bit on branding or work a bit on signage. And, you know, it's not stuff that, um, is is essential um but it's stuff that sort of reminds you of why you why you're doing this in the first place because let's be honest life is full of things that you have to do just just absolutely have to and then um all the other things that you can do or or, or optional so it's a bit matter of balancing that as well yeah absolutely and i would say right along with that uh one of the things that i had also learned is uh everything can't be a high priority, right? And so when you are someone that tends to work their tail off, and that's uh, it's a attribute that I respect in people, is that you tend to take on massive workloads. But um, what is uh, very much true is that uh, not every uh, thing that you're focused in on uh, can yield the same result. I actually like the way uh, Cheryl Sandberg referred to sort of ruthless prioritization. And so um, what I try to uh, also realize is not only am I uh, sort of protecting my calendar, but I try to put as much focus as I can on the actions and the activities that will actually move the needle. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes uh, you'll see people kind of major in the minors, right? They're getting a lot of things done that really just don't move the needle, right? And so I think if you're pr protecting your calendar, you're the most important uh, priority and you are making sure that you are focused on the right priorities with the time that you have available. Sounds simple, but it's amazing how uh, you know, many people don't do it or they do it and then they sort of slip out of it. And it's not about perfection. It's not about, sometimes you want to do the smaller things and maybe it gets you going or um, uh, it, it's just a day that you feel like focusing on it. That's okay, right? And so, or if, for example, there was a, a business got in the way of something uh, on the family side or vice versa, it's like not getting freaked out about it. Like you've got to be uh, perfect, right? It's it's realizing that you're you're striving to you know get as good as you can be and good enough oftentimes is is what I strive for on on both of those fronts. Yeah, love it, love it, and that's you know putting in that effort is probably more important than trying to keep a close eye on on everything and making sure that uh, I mean we're not robots. There's no, there's no reason that we have to fit in you know the exact hours and exact blocks that we've we've sort of outlined because we're humans and sometimes our, our minds and our bodies are much better at telling us what we need than our calendar is as well. So no, love it. Um, hey, where can people find out more about you? So you can find about me at the books website, which is be a startup superstar.com. And I have a number of people who have read the book who have reached out to me and I uh, try my very best to respond to uh, each and every outreach that people make. Awesome. Thanks for that. We'll uh, include the, the link in the description as well. Um, so you can connect with Steve on there. Um, are you ready for the top 12? I, I surprised you a little bit with it, but are you ready? I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Let's get the ball rolling. So top three books or podcasts that you recommend that are not your own. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'm going to give a couple of books uh, for you that I really uh, love. So one is an oldie, but a goodie which is Winning by Jack Welch. Uh, Jack Welch recently passed away. He was the former uh, CEO of General Electric, and he has some absolute gems in that book. And uh, to me, it's, it's a book I've reread many times. I also like a book a little bit uh, newer called Zero to One, which is by Peter Thiel. Mm -hmm. Peter is one of the uh, world's uh, most successful uh, venture capitalists. And he uh, also has some just amazing uh, advice in terms of uh, startups and you know, really building a successful future in your career, no matter where you're at. Love it. Love it. Peter Thiel's from PayPal, is that right? Or PayPal fame? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. N a new 
that name was familiar. So um, top three software tools that you can't live without. So I'm going to uh, give uh, two again since I'm uh, stuck on that. So <laughs> uh, for me, salesforce.com is, uh, is a technology I can't live without. Um, but then also Tableau. Uh, that is a um, uh, sort of a BI uh, dashboard that is uh, able to distill the nuggets that we've actually built on top of salesforce.com where I can see everything that I need to see in exactly the format I need to see it. I love it. Yeah. And what, what do you use for your calendar app? Is it just the built-in sort of iPhone um, or Google calendar or what do you yeah, use? Yeah, I just use the uh, calendar app right in our Sorry, I lost you there. Are we back? Yes, you did. I am at my beach house in Galveston, Texas, and I my internet all of a sudden became unstable. <laughs> That's all good. Um, I missed your response. So you just use the built-in Google, uh, use the built-in calendar solution. From Outlook. Oh, yep. Yep. Awesome. I mean, why not, right? I think um, even for myself, just the built-in calendar apps are, are really awesome. I know some people like to go down the road of getting their own app subscription, but often um, it does what you need. And and I think people sometimes get a bit too complex with things that um, just need to be simple. So love it. Um, top three mantras you try and live by. Uh, I try to live by um, nothing matters more to winning than surrounding yourself with A plus people. Mm -hmm. I found that uh, A plus talent um, wins. Uh, I also uh, live by a mantra that is call out the elephant in the room, right? And so oftentimes there are um, elephants that are there that is the big sort of issue that people sort of dance around and. Um, and just basically uh, never really focus in on. And then I think um, built to last, right? And so what I try to focus in on is making sure that, um, that I am always creating, focusing on creating long-term value uh, and being in, in it for the long haul. Yeah, definitely. I think too many people, again, um, are too short-sighted and talk about, you know, just making as money, much, much money upfront as possible versus just, you know, l let it just play out the long game. And that, that, that way, I think you also make sure that you're in it for the, the passion of what you're doing versus the, the money. I agree. totally agree. And what happens is, is that oftentimes if you are in it for the long haul and, you know, good things happen along the way, but if you're in it for the short, quick, uh, and easy. It, it rarely is. Yeah, definitely. Love it. Uh, top three people you follow or study and why? Uh, these are, I would say the people that are my, my mentors, honestly. So I'll, I'll give one. So, uh, one, um, in particular is, um, is Doug Irwin. Doug Irwin is, uh, not known to your listeners, but, um, mm -hmm. he is a serial entrepreneur uh, he runs a venture capital company and is um, one of the best uh, uh, managers I've ever known. Um, and so uh, Doug Irwin is someone that I, I without question, um, follow. And, and, uh, and, and if f folks could Google him, I suggest that they follow him as well. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I never heard his name, but um, I'm definitely going to look him up as well. Awesome. Um, so that's wrapped up the, the top 12. Um, thanks for your time, Steve. Um, and yeah, hope to keep in touch and connect in the future. Yeah, it was a lot of fun and uh, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. No worries. Have a good one.